Good afternoon. My name is Keith Zaromsky, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Social Science Division Chair here at Crowder College, as well as a history instructor. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to be here for Constitution Day. Today is the observance of the 230th anniversary of the agreement that the United States would move towards a more central government. This decision has been lasting for many reasons, but one in part is that we are willing to have a civil discourse about things that we may or may not agree upon. And that is the spirit of today. In our topic that we will be debating, our goal is to help all of us be more responsible citizens on this Constitution Day. However, none of this would be possible without those who take an oath to uphold and defend, even if it means sacrificing their life, to the Constitution of the United States. Those are the men and women who have bravely served and are currently serving the United States military in all five branches. At this time, it would behoove us to recognize those who served in the armed forces presently or in the past. For those of you who have served, would you please rise so we may recognize you. Before we go any further, we would like to give you a little bit of frame of reference of what we are talking about today. As you can see above me from Article 1, Section 2 of the United States Constitution, it was decided upon that every 10 years a census should occur for the purpose of reapportioning House seats, meaning representatives in the House of Representatives, depending on how population grew or shifted from state to state. Pretty straightforward, right? Until you have to redraw those districts within a state. That is where we get our topic for today. As you can see, Missouri has various representational seats. We currently live in the 7th and are served by Republican Representative Roy Blunt. I'm sorry, Roy Blunt is our senator. Billy Long is our representative. <laughs> I will study more after this. <laughs> with this, we had a change of redistricting because with the 2010 census, Missouri did not lose population, but we did not grow at the same rate as other states did. Hence, a congressional seat was reapportioned elsewhere. So, how was the decision made to do this? Well, that's what we're going to be getting into, but I will tell you, it's not always straightforward. That is where we get into our topic, gerrymandering. You see, the process needs to be done to reapportion per Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution, but it's left up to state legislatures, and a state legislature may have a majority power, that may redistrict in its benefit. The term gerrymandering comes from a very early American effort to do just that. Above me, you will see Elbridge Gerry, a founding father and early governor of Massachusetts. His state legislature was reapportioned in a way that would benefit his political leanings. As you can see, the political cartoon here was meant to represent areas that supported him that put together looked like a salamander. And that's all it took to combine Elbridge Jerry and this fictitious salamander into gerrymandering. So today, our topic will look at when we apportion these seats, how do we do it? Is it to be in straight lines? Is it to be by an independent commission? Is it to be by state legislatures? We will go back and forth. And while you may or may not have strong opinions, we're here today to not only listen, but to learn and come with an open mind. As you look at your agendas today, I want to let you know that we have a slight change. Unfortunately, Ms. Johns is under the weather and cannot be here today, so her debate instructor, Ms. Kristen Stout, has stepped up, meaning Orvikas has to debate his debate coach. <laughs> yeah. We will now have a moment of silence. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Having said that, though, Ms. Stout will be filling in and debating Mr. Vikas here on the topic today. What we're going to also be showing you is essentially how a debate works. This couldn't be possible without the Crowder uh, Speech and Debate Team, as well as my colleagues in the Social Science Division, Mr. Ron Cole and Ms. Dina Clymer, who helped me prepare this today. I will end with some closing remarks, but before that, I'm gonna turn it over to the Crowder Speech and Debate Team, who will debate this topic on how this should work. Thank you for being here, and have a great afternoon. <laughs> J. 
gerrymandering is on the rise and getting worse. The 2010 redistricting process was the most extreme in history. 2020 will be much worse if we do not start gerrymandering now. Bernard Goffer, uh, Jack Witt, uh, Chair of Democracy Studies, Professor of Political Science and Adjunct Professor of Economics at the University of California, Irvine, August 7, 2017. According to the Supreme Court, the Constitution requires that the population must equalize across the state. The idea is that if one Arizonan uh, lives in a district with one million other voters, while or other Arizonan lives in the district with only 220,000 voters, voters, then the second one's votes is more influential and the choosing a member of the Congress. To prevent those shifts from leaving unbalanced districts, state legislatures must redraw their electoral district every 10 years after the Census Bureau released its new population data. Academic expert says that 2010 redistricting round was the most extreme in the nation's history. That's because the, of the two factor, a stark partisan imbalance and uh, control of the state legislature and go, uh, government and new computer technology that make it possible to uh, draw extremely fi uh, fine-tuned partisan borders. So I propose gerrymandering should re uh, redistricting process be taken out of hand of electric official and be placed in the hand of known or by parties commissions. That means that gerrymandering should not be in the hands of our government officials where it should be in the hands of any independent commission or any bipartisan commission. Looking at the uh, points, the very first card that says gerrymandering is destroying American democracy by making it so that no districts are competitive, despite there being a roughly equal number of Democrats and Republicans, there are uh, almost no competitive districts. Explaining the card, it says that gerrymandering has destroyed our American democracy by making it so that there's a no district are competitive. The districts are making a way that the all Americans lie in one district so that the uh, so that uh, for example Republican can win that particular seat because all the Republicans are lying in that particular area. Or if you look at an example in uh, uh, like uh, in the California where like most of the Republican or Democrat they lie in a one district they group up and uh, they they create and redraw the uh, the uh, area and by gerrymandering and after that uh, they they can win the seats. Uh, the card says the Bianca is the uh, February two, uh, two, uh, 2017. Congress is deeply and uncertainly unpopular on a par with the public support for traffic jams and cockroaches and yet only eight immigrants could fix um, uh, only eight Eight increments. If there's a one silver bullet that can could fix American democracy, it's getting rid of the gerrymandering. Explaining the card, uh, only eight of the, uh, the. For example, there's a bunch of uh, you can say out of uh, government official who actually go for the re of uh, re office election. There are more than 95 percent of the officials which can actually get re-elected. That means there is a something corruption. There is something goes in the in between of that. That's where the gerrymandering case comes up because those officials actually redraw their district like that that they can win their seats, and that's how we get the repetitive officials every uh, after every election and after every election. That's why we should end this. Looking at the second, uh, third, uh, second card, gentlemen, it creates incredible, inflexible leaders who are pushed to extremes from fear of having a pri uh, primary challenges th uh, that is more extreme than them. It, that, uh, that makes comparison and governments basically impossible. But in 2017, the uncompetitive districts have seriously caused the effect, uh, effect on the integrity of the democracy. If you are elected to the represented a district that is 80% of Republican or 80% of Democrat, there's absolutely no incentives to compressive. For example, uh, there's a district which is uh, having an 80% of Republican that, then obviously the, uh, the, the seat has won by the Republican, uh, Republican representative, then that Republican representative will most likely not tend to work with the Democrat, the, the Democratic people or the, uh, or the lo local leaders because he will definitely, doesn't have any competition, he can win the same election, the re-election. Uh, looking uh, at my A2 card, non petrol bodies do not work. Most, uh, most of the democracies in the world, including Britain, Canada, and India, all use a neutral third party and have healthier democracies as a result. 
where in 2017, in the most other long-term democracies, the political neutral bodies draw a new district, perhaps an equidistant body or non-partial administrative board and comparison. As in true Canada and India, in Britain, the redistribution of parliamentary council is carried out by the non-particle boundaries commission. It's not in the hand of our, our official. Thank you. I think you all should have a moment of silence for me. Okay, so uh, my first question, I guess, is how can you ensure that these commissions are really independent and not just a reflection of the already highly partisan uh, legislatures that they're supposed to represent? As my A2 card suggests that, that there are most of the democracies in the world, for example, Canada, Britain, and India, which has actually efficiently done this work by having an independent uh, commission or a bipartisan commission. If we have an independent commission, we can have some civil services. For example, we have Indian civil services in uh, India, which actually helps, which are actually governed not by the uh, government official, which is actually governed by the teachers or or the high professors high, or uh, other people who actually helps to redraw the districts and uh, carry out the election when under the ele uh, election board. Okay, uh, then I guess my second question, you mentioned that there's some districts that are just not competitive. There's 70, 80, 90 percent of one political party. Why should we redistrict them when it's just possible that there's a lot of people that believe that polit particular political side in <laughs> Looking at the po uh, at the question, which states that uh, if there's a state which is not competitive, why why we should redraw that? That's why we need to redraw because it's not competitive. We have to make the state competitive so that the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the go government official do not get re-elected. And second point with the same question uh, that uh, if we have looking uh, if there's a state which is not competitive, but still we have a maximum of state which actually Actually, if we uh, redraw them by, you can say, not, not having any particle influence, they can become competitive. So if there's even one state which is not competitive because of that, that case, that means that there is a problem existing in that. And we have to solve that problem. We can't just, uh, uh, we can't just uh, sit here and discuss uh, that there's a one state uh, or there's a one district. Oh, not discuss about that. We have to think about even that one district. Okay. Uh, last question then. Uh, the Supreme Court is currently um, undergoing a, the case is literally being discussed today uh, in the Supreme Court and they're going to decide whether or not partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional. Why should we make a change until we know whether or not it is constitutional to do so? Okay, looking at the, as you mentioned the last question, there is a state competitive and there is not. That means that there is a problem in our system. That means that whether the Supreme Court comes up with a solution or not, we have to start solving or thinking about poor problem right now so that we can solve that problem at the later, later phase. It, we don't have to wait for the Supreme Court to, uh, to give, us, give us a result or to give us a, some, uh, some uh, regulation for that, why not we as a member or we as a government official should do it. Thank you. Yay, because. Okay. Okay, so I will be representing um, the opposition side that says both that gerrymandering really isn't uh, as large of a problem as people like to say that it is. And also more importantly, that a bipartisan or a nonpartisan commission is the solution to the wrong problem. So first, how bad is the problem? Uh, despite being discussed frequently, gerrymandering is not the norm and often backfires against the parties that choose to uh, engage in it. More homogenous living areas create um, the unclear districts. Ultimately, trying to redistrict might do more harm than good uh, because it might overprivilege diversity when there really isn't any. Like, Southwest Mo's just conservative, that's okay, right? Uh, so trying to redistrict might not be the best idea. Um, and this comes from John Sides and Eric McGee in 2015. The notion that so many of our political ills stem from gerrymandering is in fact a bad idea that simply will not die. Actual evidence from political science research shows only weak correlations between gerrymandering and both polarization and electoral competitiveness. Uh, myth number one, 
Gerrymandering a district always makes it safe for incumbents. Uh, however, partisan gerrymanders can even backfire. This happens when parties spread voters just a little too thin. When an unfavorable political tide sweeps through, uh, dummy mandered districts switch parties, undoing the advantage the gerrymandering party had supposedly engineering for itself. Uh, in short, in instances when gerrymandering has happened, uh, there's still been switches in sides. Uh, which means that they, one, did a bad job of gerrymandering, so they're not very good at it, uh, and two, that no matter what, political positions can change. Where it is that people choose to live can change. What the population of any individual district can change. Therefore, attempting to redraw those districts isn't really a very good use of uh, their time. This uh, evidence also says that partisan gerrymanders, there's a myth that uh, gerrymandering is happening and it's ubiquitous, it's happening all over. But if the assumption of many commentators is that the party in control of redistricting will automatically extract as much advantage as possible, it stands to reason that partisan gerrymanders must be everywhere. But historically speaking, the opposite is true. Fair plans have been the rule, not the exception, even in the era of computer-assisted redistricting. Basically, gerrymandering is a problem in a small um, amount of instances and isn't near as bad as people uh, like to talk about it. Secondly, is that gerrymandering backfires on the people that do it, and those redistricting efforts just get redone every 10 years. So even if there's an error in that districting, in 10 years it could shift again, which means that it's a short-lasting problem. Uh, and this is from Andrew Chung, who is an author for Reuters in 2017, September 17th. I found this yesterday. Okay, both Republicans and Democrats have been accused of gerrymandering. Uh, Nicholas Goder, a Virginia Tech redistricting expert who testifies in court for Wisconsin, said that large shifts in the mood of voters can cause even highly biased electoral maps to flip. Partisan maps have a tendency to backfire on the party that drew them. Next, districts just aren't competitive. I think that the bigger question here is whether or not we should artificially create districts that are competitive when it just might not be true. Like some areas are just more liberal or more conservative and sometimes attempting to redraw districts to make everything competitive really is a more unfair representation of the people that are there than just leaving the districts as they are. So Brian Class, who's a fellow in comparative politics at the London School of Economics, said in February of 2017, the last stubborn barrier to getting reform right is human nature. Many people prefer to be surrounded by like-minded citizens rather than feeling like a lonely red oasis in a sea of blue or vice versa. Rooting out gerrymandering won't make San Francisco or rural Texas districts more competitive no matter what computer model you use. And as the urban-rural divide in American politics intensifies, competitive districts will be harder and harder to draw. It's just the reality that we tend to group ourselves with people that are more like us Therefore, we will live near people who kind of think the way that we do, have the same values that we do. So redrawing competitive districts will be difficult because we'll just move generally to places where people are more like us if we have the opportunity. And while that's not true of each individual, like on a macro United States scale, we tend to do so. Uh, and then finally, the independent or bipartisan commissions uh, will fail. The biggest problem with independent commissions is that we have no idea what a better way to district is. So if we don't district based on race, and we don't district based on geography, and we don't district based on partisanship, what is the right way? These commissions will fail because they have the same problem as our current legislators do, is there's just we don't know what the right way is. And we've frankly not had a discussion long enough about what that should be. Uh, and John Sides and Eric McGee talked about this in 2015. Why do so many well-intentioned reformers take it as an article of faith that gerrymandering is the diabolical villain of modern American politics? Perhaps it's just tempting to think that there's a simple explanation for our bitter partisan battles, but silver bullets are usually an illusion and gerrymandering is no different. We need to have a much more sophisticated conversation about what gerrymandering is and what consequences it has. Perhaps then we'll stop pointing fingers at districts that look weird and stop talking more, talking more about what good districts should look like. And like I referenced um, in the cross-examination period, I think it's worth discussing whether or not these commissions will really be independent. If the legislatures who already control the legislature in that particular state, whether it be Republican or Democrat, get to pick who's on the commission, why wouldn't they pick people who generally represent their in interests and would create the districts in a, si a similar way? So ultimately, while I think that it's important conversation and represent representation is important, gerrymandering is 
Ending gerrymandering does not solve our problems. Okay. Ready? Go ahead. Yep. Uh, looking at the card of the backfires, negative gerrymandering, good in it. Uh, your card states that over the decades, both Republican and Democrats has been accused of gerrymandering. Does that card prove that, yes, gerrymandering has done something to our democracy till now? Uh, no, I think that it says that they've been accused of such, but like I discussed, the reason is because we don't know the right way. So obviously the party that's losing or thinks that they're the victim of that is going to presume that they've been ousted in some way, but really it's because we just don't have a good way to draw districts. Which means that you, uh, you do agree with uh, me in one stand that there is some problem uh, with gerrymandering. Sure, not all districts are perfect. I think that there are issues that happen from time to time, but an independent commission won't solve this. Uh, what, uh, what is the particular reason uh, that you mentioned in your card which proves that independent commissions has been failed in other countries? Uh, the only evidence I have references commissions in the United States or what they could look like, um, but I would assume that not all other countries are perfect, but maybe. That proves that uh, as, uh, as we uh, never had an uh, independent commission in the United States, which proves that there is no such, uh, you can say, the argument is not valid, as there, there's no such independent commission until now happened in the United States, which proves that gerrymandering has been with the government officials from the last time. Yeah, right? you are correct that the evidence is hypothetical about what would happen in the United States, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, with that, uh, myth number two, uh, which, uh, which says that uh, uh, partition gerrymandering are un ambiguous. I didn't understand what oh. the um, card that, is standing. That with. evidence is just saying that if it was true that gerrymander gerrymandering was like the key to staying in power forever, then that would be the norm not the exception. However, there have only been a couple of lawsuits related to gerrymandering, so most people play the game right. Okay. I'm good. Okay. So now we're going to take a couple of minutes of prep time to think about what we want to say before we respond to the other side. So I will furiously write. In the order will be, uh, there will be rebuttals of the card and then there will be voters. So the rebuttal starts. Uh, uh, my opponent said that uh, the commissions will fail within a hypothetical card, which proves, which actually proves that the card doesn't uh, rebuttal the point which, uh, which the affirmative stated that there has been other countries proven that in, uh, indivi individual commissions has, uh, has actually worked out very well. That proves that the card which backfires the uh, uh, affirmative card that the uh, the commission fails is actually not relevant to the uh, to the particular card. Second, uh, second uh, rebuttal uh, that uh, uh, that the, the states uh, the districts are not competitive. Looking at that particular card. Uh, districts are actually, uh, we have to make districts competitive. If they are not, we have to make them competitive. And to make that, we have to uh, give the power of the gerrymandering to, uh, to an uh, in, uh, individual commission or to an, a bipartisan commission rather than giving to the, uh, to the uh, legislators. So if, uh, and uh, as one of the card actually literally states that over the decades, Republican and Democrats have been accused of gerrymandering, that proves that the gerrymandering is a problem. And when we know that there is something problem, why don't we solve it? Why we have to sit for the Supreme Court to uh, rule about it? And why we have to say, no discuss that particular problem. So for that, uh, considering that point, we do have, uh, this topic is re relevant, and the argument which states that we have to wait for the Supreme Court to rule is actually not relevant. Now, the voters, the very first vote goes to redistricting is required, but hacking democracy is not. We are, we are okay that if you redistrict our uh, district, but hacking the democracy, no. We are not in the affirmative for hacking our democracy. We don't want 
you, uh, we don't want legislator, uh, legislator to get re-elected every time and doing the same thing. We don't want if there's an area with, with an, uh, a population of 80% Republican or 80% of Democratic and having the same member which favors those, uh, those particular ideas, not with the pe uh, people, don't even think about those people which are 20% low, uh, which, uh, which are 20 of the vice versa, maybe Democrat or Republican. We don't want having our parties uh, always fighting, not even solving. Think about health, uh, health, health, the health bill, it's medical care bill. It's not even, they're not even solving. Why? Because they fight against. That means, looking at that, if there is a seat which is Republican and then Democrat, they're not going to even work together. Now, look, uh, the second voter goes to politicians are choosing voters rather than the other way around. Democracy means that we should be the one who choose our leaders. Leaders are not the one who choose us. That's why, pol uh, th that's why gerrymandering is bad and we should actually get rid of that. The third point, gerrymandering rewards extre extre extremism. When voters of different parties are se segregated into separate districts, politicians no longer have to listen to the citizens with different political viewpoints, which proves that the, here there is actually, you can say, the, uh, one person can say is actually uh, that we are murdering our democracy by having a leader which does not even listen to the different political viewpoints. Four, outcomes do not match votes. The goal of the gerrymandering is to make sure that the votes for the opposing party leads to as few uh, seats as possible for them. The result is indisputable during the 2012 election following an aggressive Republican gerrymander in the state. More than half of the North Carolina voters cast ballots for Democratic candidates for Congress. Nonetheless, Republicans took 70% of the seat. In Pennsylvania, if you look at that, Democrats won about half of the old vote cast for Congress, but won only a quarter of the seats drawn by the Republican legislation. And, uh, uh, now at the end, there were so many points and so many cards in, uh, in my first uh, introduction speech, which I actually not get rebuttal, and I, I, uh, I mentioned in a very short, uh, in a very brief way uh, that opponent hasn't actually rebuttal that gerrymandering undermines democracy by allowing the elected representative to choose who they represent instead of voter choosing the representative. Gerrymandering. Uh, the the, uh, the opponent has not actually no uh, 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 given any particular good card, which proves that the countries Canada, Britain, and India have in India have, uh, uh, Canada, Britain, India uh, has been in a wrong way, or the in individual commissions has not been a good commission. Thank you. the negative we take we me <laughs> the negative side takes you know threats to our democracy very seriously uh, by no means is it okay to hijack said democracy nor is it okay uh, for you know leaders to choose who it is that gets to t to take the votes however I think the problem is in what is the solution and what we are saying or what I'm saying is that independent and bipartisan commissions don't solve that problem if it doesn't deal with the foundational question of what does a good district look like how should we be making those decisions about what it is otherwise we will keep falling into the same trap of districts that are not representative that have uh, people that exploit those differences in order to uh, have political gain so it's not that there's not a problem necessarily but instead that gerrymandering isn't the cause of that problem and that there's a solution but that solution isn't necessarily uh, to have an independent or bipartisan commission because those commissions could easily uh, fall to the same thing and or could be you know represented by people who say they're nonpartisan but still have a particular opinion and make those votes happen uh, in a particular way. Uh, I think that a better solution um, would be to when you know we elect our officials we should pay attention. 
And if they engage in things like gerrymandering or misrepresenting us, then we should do things like vote them out of office. Like, it's crazy that only eight people out of the like 300, I don't know, sorry, Mr. Zomfke, I don't know how many uh, House people there are right now because I can't remember, uh, how many there are don't you know, win re-election every time. Like only eight races were competitive. You know, that says something more about you know, how we should be paying attention and whether or not they are representing us. And if they're not, then we should vote them out of office by either voting them out in the primary or something else. Like, uh, you know, Mr. Yadav talked about how it causes them not to compromise, but we elect them to represent our position. So if compromising isn't something that we want them to do because we're firm on that position, then I think that's okay. And if they lose in the primaries to someone who supports us more strongly, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just like kind of a more intense version of democracy, I guess, uh, where those people represent us a little bit more strongly. But I don't think that's necessarily wrong. Um, also, you know, uh, I think that the commissions, uh, even though there could be examples from Britain and Canada uh, and India of how they work, those don't necessarily uh, have the same hallmarks of the democracy that we've created. Our democracy is unique. Therefore, solutions from other countries won't necessarily work here because all those other countries also have a lot of other safeguards in place that make like a nonpartisan commission more viable than the way that we uh, do things um, in the United States. Uh, yes, gerrymandering is a problem, but a very small one. In fact, I've read multiple pieces of research that said, you know, that it is not the norm. It is, in fact, the exception to the rule. So, you know, changing the entire districting process to deal with a couple of bad apples might not be the best way uh, when we could instead, you know, work on voting those people out of office that do things that they shouldn't be doing and we should be paying attention uh, when they do that. Uh, but ultimately, the question that we should be asking ourselves is, you know, is it good to force competition in districts that aren't necessarily so? I think that's like the real question is, you know, there's multiple pieces of research, including one from class uh, in 2017 that I referenced in my first speech that just says that we tend to live and be near people who are like us. If we're going to keep doing that, like as a society, right, we keep, you know, living and moving and being in places where people are more and more like us, does it make sense to force competition? to force a district to be 49-51 or 55-45, when in reality, that district is, should be more 70-30. Like, there are places that are more conservative. There are places that are more liberal. All of those places are good, but to force competition doesn't necessarily make sense because some of those districts just don't require it. And my concern is that if we switch to a new form of of, you know, of drawing districts that privileges you know, any one thing that it just causes the problem to replicate in a different way. So then it's a geogra geography question or you know, then it's a partisan question or then you know, we, people used to do gerrymandering based on race which is illegal and theoretically no longer happens but it's just going to change the problem to a different way if we don't come to the root of the question which is like what does a good district look like. So, Maybe an independent commission could be good. Uh, maybe they could even be the right solution, but only after we think about what a good district looks like and what the right way to uh, support them or to divide them is before we can ever make a change that is lasting. Thank you. And so ends our debate. Please join me in giving them another round of applause. Now, while we won't be officially judging or taking a vote, I do want to allow any questions for either of our debaters if they come up. Mr. Jeff Elwood, what's your question, sir? Mr. Kakas, yes. the independent commissions that you speak of, is there a cost to taxpayers for that bill? Sir, what say you? Uh, actually, uh, For the independent commission, if uh, that particular question, if we look on that, the amount that they act, the legislator used to re redesign the uh, the district is actually comes out to be equal or less than that because there has been uh, like there are mathematicians when I was doing the research I get to know that who are actually crying to help our legislator to redesign the district. They literally have some uh, softwares and they have everything that they can use 
to redesign it, which is actually cheaper rather than uh, having a like, bunch of legislator and wasting their, uh, you can say, office hour to redesign them, whereas they can work on our medical uh, bill and other stuff. Sir, does that answer your question? Take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is a cost, but I believe you were yeah. saying is that they could potentially be less. Thank you. For the computer to read just you out when I run for office. So. <laughs> Sorry, that was supposed to be in or my water. Yes, sir, Matthew Cole. Uh, I have a question for Mrs. Stout. Mrs. Stout? Uh, you claim that maybe competition, enforcing competition in some districts might be uh, bad uh, for these districts, but isn't it possible that if we have competition between the two parties, it might actually make them more representative of the people and willing to listen to other sides? It could. I think that that's like true in some districts. I think the real question is whether most districts actually are. There's obviously districts that are competitive and there's, you know, like there's swing states that change based on each election, but the vast majority of districts aren't. So to like redistrict those to force competition feels a little bit like forcing a debate that isn't being had in that area. So overprivileges the voices of people that got redistricted in to make it competitive in the first place. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Sir, first. This is uh, from Detox. Um, so, Stout says that um, if we just have like, nonpartisan efforts to redistrict, it's just going to replicate growth. Sorry, replicate the problem in different areas. But in those other countries that just can't in Britain, where they do have nonpartisan efforts, uh, do any of those problems occur? If we look on the, uh, the uh, I can actually literally say, it, uh, Example of India, <laughs> because uh, I belong here and I know the, uh, the democracy and how the government works over there a little bit more. Uh, if we look on the India part, uh, if uh, the Indian uh, civil services, those were the one who actually helps to redesign the district and other stuff, and there has not been that much problem to uh, that cause that particular problem, where, uh, whereas if you look on the uh, problems that has been caused by the legislator in US are more than the one that, that are caused by the Indian civil service, because those are actually not biased. They, they don't think about the votes goes to Republican or Democrats. Whereas here, when the legislator are gonna make the district, they're gonna think about, oh yeah, these are a bunch of Republicans and these are a bunch of uh, Democrats. Let, let's make a district like that, so that they can win the seat. And whereas in India, or oh, obviously I don't know about that much about Britain and Canada, in India, the Indian civil services, they do not think about uh, which party, they, uh, uh, like you can see their viewpoint, they make the, on the basis of geography, not on the basis of the race, or you can say, or not on the basis of the party viewpoints of the people over there. Thank you. Yes, um, this is from Ms. Dow. Um, you say that redistricting occurs every 10 years. Well, most elections occur more often, and the presidential election is every four years. So when these politicians redistrict for a particular position or to sway an electoral vote, um, would I be correct in assuming that at the next vote, their redistricting may only cause the population to be in an oppositional position, not in an endorsing one? And if so, is this just to secure this vote and hope the next one isn't more important or of greater necessity to our nation's growth and profitability? Yes. <laughs> uh, so when they do make those changes, they do stay for 10 years. Um, however, you know, populations change a lot within those 10 years. That's why we like redo them is because every 10 years or so they need to reevaluate the, uh, you know, the demographics of that. So I think that if someone, uh, you know, gerrymandered in hopes of getting like, let's say 55% of the vote, that it's pretty easy for that 5% to sway over the course of those 10 years. And in fact, some of that research that I referenced said that like a bunch of times that people have tried to gerrymander, it backfired on them and they lost because they like got too greedy, so that it might not always be the case that it does. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers. I understand that populations are always changing, but the number of people that die each year is almost tripled by the number of people that are born each year. So even though the populations are changing, they are changing more by the amount of people that are growing and not dying. So by the population changing almost as quickly as we're voting, redistricting every 10 years is just not meeting up to the population that is growing faster than what they're doing. Potentially. 
and you would need a constitutional amendment yeah. to change what's already currently. You can contact a representative to propose that. Hunter. Uh, this is for Vikas. You keep comparing India to America, but India is a very different country, both historically, governmentally, culturally. So wouldn't it be the same as comparing apples to oranges whenever you draw parallels between the two countries? Let's get the question. <laughs> uh, okay, the point comes in, uh, the, I keep comparing America and India or whatever other countries, Canada and Britain, uh, but uh, when, it, uh, when the point comes about redistricting, restricting them, yes, the uh, U.S. has been very different historically and geographically even, uh, like U.S. got independence away, uh, ahead of us and other stuff. So, <laughs> but uh, when, when the point comes of redistricting that, whereas the, uh, uh, India has been more diverse than U.S., I can literally say that, and uh, so we have have that you can say the in, uh, independent commission that has that. That's the only part that comes out which actually favors the United States also. Not only uh, like that particular for example, it's not about like uh, oranges and apples. You can say that if there's a X Y Z uh, person who are doing a correct thing. And uh, we are ABC people, we are not doing a correct thing, and we know that XYZ is doing the right thing. Why not we just try, even try to do the same thing rather than just not doing anything, having the same particular thing? Even, uh, for example, gerrymandering, my opponent literally said that there has been accusation of the Republican and Democrats that uh, they misuse that. So why not we try to uh, solve that by give, uh, taking the examples from other countries? Why we have to just be like you can say, OK, I can't take examples on other people. We have to be on ourselves, no. Last questions. Yes. I have a question for Sorry, I haven't heard your name. It's OK. Um, you said that gerrymandering hasn't really been an issue yet because that's become a norm. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, well, I actually um, have some research that was done by political scientists that said that like created a list of like why do we have the partisan divide that we have and why are we the way that we th why is it that we have things the way that they are and it says that gerrymandering is very low on the list that it's like we just genuinely genuinely have strong political divides in this country and to try and blame it on gerrymandering instead of just like we have different visions of what the country should be like is inaccurate. So the partisan news, yes, there, are, there is a lot of that. However, uh, I think that just like goes to show that we have very different views of what the country should look like. And we have to have the conversation head on instead of trying to artificially create competitive districts to force that conversation. As we wrap up, I want you to see what went on here. There wasn't a single name called. <laughs> there was no yelling. There was no disrespect. There was admittance to other sides of an argument, but then a rebuttal. Students, we all have what are called blind spots in our political philosophies, places that we're set on something, but we aren't necessarily always able to see. Discourse such as this isn't meant to say, this is what you should believe. It's meant to make you a more well-rounded individual that's more able to critically think politically, historically, and simply just critically for your future employment. If you can do something like that here today, you're going to be able to do that in every future opportunity that you have. And having said that, I would like to thank our Constitution Day partners. At the bottom of our programs, you can see we could have done this without the Bill Margo Lee Library, who was able to set up a display out front. If you want to read more about this topic, they have set up not only just a couple of books that you can sign out and check out, but they have e-books that you can actually use the QR uh, reader on your phone and check out even before you get to the parking lot. Uh, the Crown of Public Information was responsible for making all the great graphics for us. Uh, the Crown of Print Shop was able to print these and uh, create those graphics as well. And of course, Crowder's speech and debate that we'll now thank one more time.